anyone I know been treated for depression? I know people treated for depression, like taking medicine, whatever, but I don't, yes, yes, I guess so, sure. No, not that I know of. Not that I know of, no. Actually, I don't know anyone that's been treated for depression. Actually, no, I don't know anyone that has been treated for that. Depression? Yeah. No, not at all, no, I'm very normal. I've heard of cases in school, but that's about it. My mom, she used to, but she got through it with a therapist and everything. But she, I think she had troubles with, uh, when she was younger because she didn't have that, many, that much confidence. But when she get to the therapist, she found out that she's a good person and she don't have nothing to look down on. Yeah, my sister has, and um, they put her on like Prozac or something, and I guess it's supposed to help her alter her moods so she's not as depressed and like sad and feels lonely. One time I was on antidepressants. Actually, a couple of my friends have been recently treated for depression. Both of them, I think it was in the beginning of college that they started to feel a little lonely or like they were um, just like out of place from home. So I have. Oh, it's just a lot of changes, a lot of things that were unexpected, and it's it's hard to cope with. Uh, I mean, you have friends, you have friends, you have family, uh, but you know, it's still a large part. You know, it's a something you have to go through. So. According to the National Center for Health and Wellness, as many as 1 in 8 teenagers are affected by depression. Between 3 and 5 percent of the teenage population experiences depression each year. But less than a quarter of those individuals will receive proper treatment. The kind of depression we're talking about isn't a brief period of sadness following a loss or disappointment. It's the constant feeling of sadness, complete hopelessness and despair. It's a feeling that persists day after day. This type of depression is called a depressive illness or a clinical depression. How can we recognize the signs of depression in a friend? And encourage them to get the help they need to get better. Teenage depression. That's what we'll be talking about today. Hi everyone, I'm Jess. And I'm Jack. And, and this, this is, is Real Faith, Faith TV. TV. Our spotlight guest, Peter Feigl, has battled depression for 35 years, beginning at the age of 12. We'll hear how he has struggled with this illness and how he is an advocate for those suffering from depression and other forms of mental illness. We'll also hear from the teens on the street again. But first, let's meet our studio guests and find out what kinds of experiences they have with depression. They are Anne-Marie, Phil, Nicole, Ijama, Sarah, and Vince. So, have any of you guys suffered from depression or had a friend or someone you knew who has? I have a friend who, um, she applied to Yale and didn't make it in and ever since then she's been, you know, really depressed and trying to, you know, cope with the fact that her dreams of going to an Ivy League school are crushed and she's been really depressed and going to a therapist for a, a while now. I have a friend who um, it's biological, the depression, so she has to go to the therapist and get medicine to make all the feelings of sadness and anxiety go away. I have a friend who we, we're not psychiatrists and we're not doctors, so we can't tell if she has a clinical depression or not, but um, through her relationships and through times in her life we watch her and we make sure she's always alright and whenever she needs us for advice or just regular friendship, we're always there for her. Yeah, like, I have a friend who's always depressed, and I always try to talk to her and say, hey, everything will get better. She never believes me, and it frustrates me that she's totally convinced that everything will just keep being wrong. When I know for a fact, because I've gone through depression, I'm sure, I'm sure most teenagers go through depression, that it'll all get better, but she's totally convinced otherwise. What do you think causes depression, and what are the signs? That's what we ask the teens in the street. Let's check it out. Some of the causes, probably being bullied, teased, called stupid, how their parents treat them, how their friends are to them. School, being stressed out. Family deaths, the war in Iraq. Crazy relationships. Stress. Parents who abuse them. Friend problems, like all the drama in high school. Some bad experience in their life. It has a lot to do with growing up, like your childhood or just some of the stuff you've experienced or anything. Peer pressure, popularity, um, different drugs that are going around, partying, anything that can make you feel like less of a person. Sudden change. When things are happy in their life, they can't be happy about it. So, do you know of any symptoms or signs of someone experiencing a serious depression? 
I think it would be trying maybe keeping away from everybody, a change in complete attitude, sticking away from doing things that they used to do. Like I guess stereotypical but people wearing black. Well the way they described it was that they were completely unmotivated from doing anything. Sadness, feeling alone, um, thoughts of suicide maybe. Well I guess thoughts of like suicide. Certain um, eating disorders as well, uh, whether that be um, overeating or not eating. Being sad a lot, crying for no reason. Probably they would cut their wrists. Disrespecting yourself, like cutting yourself I guess, or doing drugs. Maybe they try to take painkillers or something, or they try to drink their problems away or take drugs or smoke weed. They're always down, never really want to talk. So if you have any hobbies that you have done that you just all of a sudden don't really feel like doing anymore, that's a symptom. They don't want to go to school, they don't want to do any activities. I know, like not telling how you feel, like ignoring people. But if I didn't have any prior uh, engagements to attend or to do, I slept, you know, like 12 hours. Um, not only that, but I really didn't know why I was doing, what I was doing in school. I didn't know, you know, the point of it, and it was it, it was quite difficult in that sense. I had a friend. Um, she was really depressed because, like, I guess she was put down by her parents and her family members a lot. And um, you know, at first I didn't realize anything, but then she started like giving away her stuff, and um, she gave me like. I, we were like best friends and she gave me one of her like dolls that she loved I guess and she got when she was younger and she told me she wanted me to have it you know and always keep it to remember her by and I was like remember you by you know like you're you're my best friend I'm not gonna forget about you so it was just like really scary because I started realizing you know that she was having like suicidal thoughts she was really depressed when she started giving her things away yeah that's I guess that would be a symptom of depression but I would think like other symptoms would be like physical things like having headaches and stomach aches because having chemical imbalances in your body can just, you know, th throw your entire body systems out of whack too. Yeah, yeah and also, oh. I have uh, the friend that I talked about before who um, didn't get accepted to Yale. She actually took out her emotional frustration and depression out on herself by physically hurting herself and trying to divert her emotional pain into physical pain. Yeah, another symptom is like keeping to yourself a lot. Like people who are depressed tend to like in not interact with other friends and family members. Yeah, they feel like no one else knows what they're going through, so they just keep it all inside, and then sometimes they'll act out. Yeah, and like sometimes they'll have trouble going to sleep, and then when they finally get to sleep, they don't want to wake up. They won't get out of bed, and then when they're like going to get something to eat, they'll they won't eat anything, they'll just sit there and stare at their food, then throw it out. Yeah, and I think as some of the teens on the street said, there's society pressures, like kids in um, school will pressure you and it makes you feel um, solitary and then you get that alone feeling and become depressed that way. I think one of the hardest things about depression is that, you know, after you've beaten it, it can still come back, you know, like it comes in waves. Like, for example, our spotlight guest, Peter Feigl, has the kind of depression that keeps coming back. Next, let's hear about his experience when he was first diagnosed with depression. I, I got hit when I was about 12, 13 years old, and then I was first hospitalized when I was 15. This depression hit me relatively quickly, uh, and within about two or three weeks, my grades went from A's to C's to F's. I stopped going to football practice. I broke up with my girlfriend. I didn't want to see my friends anymore. Couldn't sleep night after night after night. Couldn't eat. The food tastes like ash or iron in your mouth. You know, I felt like crying all the time. You know, I felt like getting a fight all the time. You know, and what's going on? I felt like I was jumping out of my skin. And finally, I was just, I was in such a bad state that I had to go to the hospital. And in the, in the hospital, I got good effective help, wonderful mental health professionals that were angels, doctors and the right medicines and the right therapy and a place where I felt safe, like an oasis where things were safe. And it was a place where I was able to get that medical help I was able to, to start again to hear those good, good voices inside from, that, that, that come from God. It was something that absolutely saved my life. You know, I think it's important that people understand that um, clinical depression is a real medical condition. And if you suspect your friend is depressed, you should encourage them to get help. So, do you guys think that most people see the difference between just regular depression and clinical depression? Um, I don't think until you have just seen someone go through cl clinical depression that you understand the full impact. 
it has. Yeah, I think sometimes people um, experience a little tragedy or a little like downtime in their life and they say that and they over exaggerate and they say, oh my gosh, I have depression, but it could just be a little phase of like sadness and that's okay and it's not necessarily clinical depression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know like among my friends, I've experienced both, you know, uh, like I have friends who are kind of like, oh, I'm so depressed about this, you know, and they're, they're very sad for a period of time, but then you get over it, you know? But then I also have friends who are clinically depressed and you ask them like, why are you depressed? And they're like, I don't know, you know? They, they, it's just something that happens to them with their body chemistry, you know? They really don't have much to be depressed about. It's kind of like they're just depressed. While the people who don't have clinical depression have like specific things that they're depressed about. That's what I've noticed, at least like in my friends. My friend uh, that we keep track of all the time, whenever something goes wrong, or if she just puts her head down for a second, we are right there to find out, you know, are you okay, is everything right? And we, we feel bad sometimes that we're over-exaggerating her, you know, normal sadness, but we, you know, we fear for her and we want to be there for her. You know, I think one of the problems is like, we don't, like when we're trying to help a friend, we don't realize like, you know, how serious it could be. It could be like, you know, they're just sad for a couple of days because they broke up with their boyfriend or they're really depressed because they broke up with their boyfriend. What do you think you can do to help a friend who's depressed? Well, let's find out what advice the teens in the street have about this. Be there for them. Like, be friendly, talk it out with them, like, don't judge them. First try to give them compliments and, like, try to convince them that they're a good person. And, like, if that don't work, try to ask them to get uh, professional help or go to church. Oh, talk to them a lot, see maybe what their problem is, and if, you know, they're really doing something that's life-threatening, maybe they should get help, you know, do something about it, because you don't want to see something bad happen to your friend, you know? Try and talk to them more, you know, make them, like, more feel like comfort. Yeah, they should vent and not keep it in, because keeping it in makes it harder to deal with, and if you talk to people about it, it helps a lot. Maybe talk to their parents or have them talk to them each other and say that they need help or something. You have to find out, you know, how to fight it one way or another. I think the only thing you can do is either offer help or help them get more help, I think. So as a good friend, you wouldn't want to just watch them deteriorate. I think, you know, if you're going to help someone, you have to make sure your presence is known to them and that you offer them your full support. Yeah, I agree with you totally. I have friends who um, have had suicidal thoughts, and um, sometimes they want me to like call other friends that they trust more than me. And the thing is, like, my friend called me at like two o'clock in the morning. I stayed on the phone with her all night until we could reach this other friend. And I have other friends who I, I feel so great when I can help them. And the thing is, I think the best thing is if they ask you for help, you should be there because if they can work up the courage to ask you, I mean, there's no reason to say no. Yeah, and even if you, you think that they should get clinical help or, you know, any type of adult help, you can still be there. Like, even if you don't know what to say, you can just listen to what they have to say so that they can vent like the teens on the streets. Yeah, because it's a lot better to get stuff out like that than keep it pending for such a long time that it becomes, it turns to, like, outward actions. Like, they can turn violent sometimes. Not necessarily only getting professional help, but if you're going to be a friend to someone who's depressed, try and give them hope because mm -hmm. depression is something that we're, they're constantly sad and they can't always see the hope. And if you say something so little as well, um, tomorrow's a big volleyball game in gym class or something little like that, like that can just help so much more. Show them that there's things to look forward to. Like, take them somewhere to have fun and let them relax and let loose. The one girl said, you wouldn't want to see your friend deteriorate, so you would, like, just stay by their side the whole time. If you have a friend who is experiencing depression, they need your support. But don't try to be their psychologist or psychiatrist. If they're experiencing a serious depression, they need professional help. Encourage them to talk to their parents, school counselor, youth minister, or other trusted adult. Sometimes they might not even be willing to take the necessary steps to help themselves, so you as a friend may need to contact a trusted adult for them. The most successful treatment for depression is through the care of a health professional. Next, Pete Feigl talks about this. You know, one of the schools that I was at talking, when I was done speaking, two girls came up and they had one of their buddies, and they, had her, one, they were holding her hands and they said, you know, Karen's struggling with depression, and she had tears in his eyes in her eyes and we said okay and we got her to the school nurse 
that moment. And, and we got her help, and I learned later, you know, the, the parents got involved, and the doctor, and she's doing great. Mainly what they do, if you get hit with depression, is it's going to be a combination of medicines and a combination of therapy. The medicines are medicines that, uh, that help your brain produce the right number of chemicals in the brain. The therapy is to talk about stresses and things that are going wrong in your life, uh, way to, ways to, 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 to calm your spirit down in terms of, 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 of trying to get on the right track. This combination of medication and therapy uh, is very successful. There are so many things that are within my control with my depression, but there are many things that are not in my control, and that's where God comes in, where he helps me every day with that. Creativity. The creativity is an essential part of recovery. So when you can't find the words to talk about it, that's where you turn to painting, sculpture, dance, music, hitting a baseball, working on a car, finding things that you love, volunteering. I mean, sometimes with these illnesses, you get so down and you focus on yourself, but you still need to focus on others. That's a way that you keep that sense of, 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 of importance. So all of these things, the medicine, the therapy, absolutely, but the faith, the creativity, the volunteering, the focusing your life not on your wounds but on what you love, all of those are important. Yeah, actually one of my close friends has clinical depression and she takes like pills and stuff um, every day for it. But one of the ways I try and help her out is, you know, to be extra nice and forgiving because sometimes she'll like lash out at people like even me and I'm one of her close friends and everything. And it's just one of those things where you kind of have to take a step back and not really get mad and kind of just say, that's not you talking, you know, that's the illness. So it's just, that's one of the ways that I try and help her is just forgiving and be there for her through thick and thin and everything. And I think that's something we all need to do. I find in creative ways to occupy yourself and get your mind off of the depression, off of the problem in your life or in their life can be a, a very helpful way in helping them overcome that obstacle of the depression. I like to run. So I'll go run and then it'll relieve my anxiety or whatever I'm going through or talk to someone or um, play soccer, which I like to do. Something very active that can get my mind off of it as well as it's physical so it releases the stress or anxiety or depression, whatever it might be. A while ago, one of my friends was having a problem like with depression. She, uh, she did bad on her finals and she was really upset about it. And so I called her, I was like, listen, meet me at the movies. And we went and like after that she felt so relieved, she had a good time and she was really relaxed about it. And it made me feel good to know that I helped her like feel better and not worry about the depression so much. I had a friend, you know, um, she was really depressed and she was a really talented artist. So when she was depressed she completely stopped painting and drawing and everything. So after a while my friend and I were like getting really worried so we went over to her house and we're like, just, just draw just draw right now. So she started drawing and she actually drew like these really morbid, horrible pictures. But she sent them away to get like published and she showed, like the pictures showed what depression could do to someone. And she kind of turned that into an outlet and she was able to help other people. Like Pete Feigl who talks to thousands of teenagers a year. He always encourages them to be kind to the people around them. Next, he shares a story of how a simple act of kindness saved him. People were kind to me. My family, uh, my friends, teachers, my high school teachers, people giving me my change at the Super America, you know, the convenience store. All these people made a difference in my life. When I was 16 and I just got back from the hospital, the mental hospital that I told you about, and people were, nobody was mean to me, nobody called me names, but nobody would say anything, not because they were mean, because they didn't know what to say. But I remember I'm sitting in the, the lunchroom at my little town in Pine Island, Minnesota, and I can't take one bite of my mashed potatoes because the lump in my throat is so big because these five seats around me are empty, but yet beyond that in both directions, the table is filled with kids there eating and talking and laughing. And nothing is more terrible than being 16 years old and sitting alone in a lunchroom. And I still remember the day where I'm sitting there and this kid walks up and he's got his tray and he says, just as casually as can be, can I sit next to you? And that was 1972. And I can tell you what I was wearing that day. That kid saved my life. And maybe it was for the two minutes while it took for me to eat my lunch, but that was a victory that got me through that terrible lonely lunch hour. And then that was a victory that helped me get through that terrible lonely day. And I told this kid, who's now a 51-year-old man and one of my best friends now. He didn't remember, but he was so glad that it made that difference to me. 
you know, it's kindness. I think that that's how I see the face of God every day, is in the faces of kindness of all the people I meet. Reach out to those people. Understand that, you know, they have a real illness of the brain, but they're also struggling with their hearts and souls because this illness hits that. So take that extra minute, sit next to them in the lunchroom, you know, call them up on the phone. Uh, that is the most important thing that you can do, is to reach out to them and be kind to them. A couple years ago in school, we um, had an assembly, and it was a, a speaker about suicide, and he talked about, you know, how he wanted to kill himself, so he wrote a note saying, you know, no, if no one looks at me when I walk down the hallway, if nobody smiles at me, I'm going to kill myself. So he walked down the hallway, no one, no one even looked at him, and he walked down the street, no one looked at him. And so he's getting ready to jump off a bridge and he's crying and sobbing and nobody's gonna, no one's stopping for him. Nobody's even noticing him until finally like a stranger comes up to him and you know, they just put on a friendly face and they're like, you know, are you okay? And he says that that person saved his life. And you know, he actually, the friend I was talking about earlier who was giving away her possessions, um, when she heard this, she was completely turned around. Like she was so surprised and she realized, you know, that she, do, she does have people who care about her. You may also encourage your friend to come to church. Sometimes receiving the sacraments is a source of comfort. Do you think there are other ways that someone's faith or relationship with God can help them battle depression? That's why we ask the teens on the street. Let's check it out. Do you think having a relationship with God can help someone to overcome the depression or cope with it? Of course, because God, God leads you in a light direction. I think it could help them, maybe the look for inspiration. Definitely. Yeah, because they will always know that there's someone there watching over them. And I think that, you know, with God all things are possible and that when you have the Lord on your side, you know, anything is, you know, everything is positive. Then you know there's something bigger or like greater, so you know that He's watching out for you. That would definitely help because you have something to believe in. If you're in church, like, they understand. Like, you could talk to them about, like, what's going on. So I think it helps a little bit. There have been plenty of people who have um, gone to religion as some way of coping with a lot of their problems. I think that if you have something to believe in, a faith to follow, that it can help you figure out a lot of your problems. I've seen quite a few people who have, you know, turned to God and found their answers in God, um, you know, by accepting God and Jesus Christ into their lives, they, you know, make a big change. Prayer and scripture is an important lifeline for those suffering from depression. Next, Pete Feigl shares a little more about depression and how God was always there for him. Even when he couldn't feel him or hear him. Things are changing all the time and when we live under those kind of changes, that's stress. Stress is just change. And what we've discovered, for instance, with depression is with the medical model that we have of depression is that when you live under too much stress, a little bit of stress is good, it's a good motivator, but when you live under too much stress, it can change, physically change you. Your skin temperature gets different, your, your uh, adrenaline system is, is kicking out more uh, adrenaline into your kidneys, your gastrointestinal tract is more upset, there's more acid in your gut, your heart pounds a little faster, you breathe a little bit differently, your white blood count goes down, making you more susceptible to colds or flus. And when all of these internal systems are thrown off by stress, it can throw off the most delicate of all of our inner systems, which are the neurotransmitters in our brain. These serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, these chemical messenger systems which are run the ship. And if those get out of whack, that's where you get things like depression. It's a real disease of the brain that you get. It's not laziness or weakness or flaws of character. It's a real disease. God's arm was always around my shoulder, but in this despair, there were times where I couldn't feel it. I couldn't hear God's voice. And it's a terrible place to be. You don't, you don't want to be awake. I think that faith is not this insurance policy to protect us from life. You know, bad things are going to happen to us. I think faith, the real question of faith is when things, bad things do happen, are we going to, you know, hide in fear or realize we have the courage with our friends and our family and with our Heavenly Father to face whatever it is, that things are going to be okay. As Catholic Christians, we are people of hope. What hope can our faith offer to those people who are suffering from depression? I think God blessed uh, all of us with kindness and love so that we can give people who have problems like depression hope for themselves. Yeah, I have a personal experience with it where I was asking for God in a time of need 
and he came in the form of my father. I was really upset about just depressed and crying a lot about um, a breakup a couple years ago. And my dad came home early uh, when there was no one in the house and he came home early, surprisingly. And he found me just bawling and really upset. And he came to me and he gave me this, I don't know if anyone knows, the Footprints poem mm -hmm. about yeah. when God's holding you, when the, why is there only one step? footprints in the sand, it's because that's when God's carrying you. And he gave me that advice and he hugged me and he told me it's going to be okay, you're going to get through this. And that's the thing that helped me through my depressed time. And I think something like that can really help others as far as faith. Like Teens on the Street said, God is always there for you. And, and people say God works in mysterious ways and he does. He works through people on the earth. He works through family, friends, and anybody you can possibly meet in your life. God understands sadness. But stronger than any emotion or problem we could have is the love that God has for us. He wants to support us and encourage us and cheer us. He wants to be our hope. He has given each of us special gifts to help us. He has given us people that care, people who help. So if you or a friend are in immediate emotional need, help is available 24 hours a day at the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. The phone number is 1-800-273-TALK. We will also be posting links to websites with resources on depression on our website, www.realfaithtv.com. And remember to care for our friends, because anytime we care for an ill person, we care for Christ. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Real, Real Faith, Faith TV. TV. God bless.